Video recordings of this podcast can be found on RaisingEquity.org and Truth to Power on YouTube. Welcome to the Raising Equity podcast, where we think deeply and talk about issues of equity and identity. One of the series I've been thinking a lot about is Black women, Black women's worth and our inherent worth and dignity that oftentimes gets erased. And it, it got me thinking about intersectionality, which has become a buzzword, uh, but where it really came from. And Kimberly Crenshaw, for those of you who don't know, was the originator of that concept. And the reason why she came up with it was because there was a case, five women brought this case against GM around employment discrimination. And the court said, well, GM hires women, but they hired white women. And well, they hire men, but black men. And so they argued that there was no sex discrimination or racial discrimination. But essentially that left black women at the margins, erased at the intersections. And so intersectionality theory is all about helping us see those who are at the margins. And so I wanted to do a series of conversations with Black women about Black women, about our inherent worth that often gets erased and lost, how we navigate the challenges of society, and what we do to stay grounded and centered, and, and, and what we do to cultivate our own worth and dignity. So today I have with me a woman who is so many things, an activist, a nurse, a fierce advocate for Black mothers and children, a lover of all Black people, an emerging public health scholar who's now a current Olin Fellow at the Brown School at Washington University. She's a fellow with the Black Census Lab, an organizer with Close the Workhouse, and board member at Jamal Birth Village. Brittany Farrell, thanks so much for joining me. Yeah, thank you for having me. Yeah. So I know that you're in the midst of like travel, work, and so many things. I appreciate you sitting down with me. Maybe start with telling me a little bit about some of the projects you're working on right now. Well, so many. Let me see. Um, so at the lab, which is um, Black Futures Lab based in the Bay, we conducted the largest Black census since like in the last 153 years. And it closed on December 31st of 2018. So since then, we've been in the data analysis phase. And um, I'm excited because next month we're releasing a report of what Black people have said across the country with nearly 40,000 responses from Black people. This is data that no one has ever thought to collect. No one has ever thought to ask Black people, what do you want for your communities, for your future? And so. Um, I've been working with my team on that, and it's been super excellent work. Um, in addition to that, working with Jamai Birth Village in Ferguson. And so we were donated a new building last year. And so getting ready to move into a new building, we the board, we've been doing a lot of work around making sure that we have the proper things in place to make that move the best move. Um, working with the Close the Workhouse campaign. Um, on getting that workhouse closed, uh, not just because the majority of the people incarcerated in the workhouse are being held because they could not afford bail, but also because the workhouse is a huge public health crisis in the city, um, and it's doing a lot more harm than it's doing good. Uh, school and parenting and so many things. So many things. Yeah. So maybe let's start with the Jamal Birth Village. Mm -hmm. Can you tell people a little bit about why that is so necessary and why that space is something that you've committed board time to? Well, True, uh, Brittany True Kalman, she asked me over a year ago to be a part of the board at mm -hmm. um, the birth center. And it was like fate, right? Because at that time, I was really committing myself to wanting to do work to save the lives of Black women and Black babies. And even though my role at, the, at Jama is mostly a part of the decision-making, um, being a part of something that this city needs so desperately was a big deal. You know, um, the national maternal mortality rate and infant mortality rate for Black women and Black babies is unacceptable. And those that same disparity, it exists in this city, right? And we, we need a facility like Jama. Um, and so when she asked, no questions asked, I was like, absolutely. Because 
it's a part of the work, right? It's a part of achieving justice for Black women, for Black pregnant people, for Black babies. And I was all about it. Yeah. And that it's a perfect and tragic example of why intersectionality is important when we think about maternal child health, right? Mm-hmm. Because, I mean, it's not okay for any baby or any mother to be dying. But unless we look at the data by race, we miss the fact that it's Black women that are at increased risk. And I can't remember the numbers off the top of my head, but is it Black babies are, is it three and a half times more likely? Black babies? Yes. Two to three times. Two to three times more likely to die before their first birthday than white babies. Right. And so I know that Generate Health that's here in St. Louis is one of the first uh, kind of conglomerates of folks who are doing maternal child health to not just say that we want to help all babies, but actually name racial inequity. Mm -hmm. And so to have the work of Generate Health, which brings a lot of funding into the area and someplace like Jamal Birth Village, it's exciting because it makes me think we might actually move the needle. Um, because I know as a black woman, until I was pregnant, I didn't understand. I didn't understand the disparity and that I was at increased risk. Um, and it was only through my own experiences that I started to learn. Mm-hmm. It's a perfect example of how we get lost at the margins. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's frightening. Ever yeah. since I've started doing this work, I, I reflect often on when I was pregnant. I was 18 when I was pregnant. I knew nothing about maternal health reproductive health, anything. I knew nothing about a lot of things, you know? Um, And it wasn't even uh, in my cards at the time to go to college, you know? So when I think about what I was at risk for, and then I reflect on some of my experiences during my labor, it's a fog, it's a blur. You know, I received IV narcotics that I didn't ask for. And, you know, it was just like, oh, wow. the Things happened to me that I didn't know were happening to me, and I can't even recall the majority of my labor because I didn't know that self-advocacy was a thing. You know, I had no idea how I was supposed to be treated. Mm -hmm. And so there are so many other women and girls and pregnant people who go through this system and who not only their lives and their lives with their babies are not equally um, valued in the same way as our white counterparts, but who are also just stripped of their dignity, not knowing what power is theirs when they're in those settings. Yes. And I think my experience was very different. So I was uh, 27 and uh, had my PhD, was a professor in the university, had my birth plan. And it makes me think how the reactions that I got, it was very much kind of like, how dare you come in Mm -hmm. here and expect so much? Mm -hmm. And I thought it was because they were just upset about this woman who had a you know plan. And I do think sometimes people poo-poo birth plans, right? Oh, yeah. But I wonder how much of that was also tinged with racism. Mm-hmm. And or even just one of my doctors saying, oh, you know, Black women just gain more weight or Black women just this. And I'm thinking... That's so ridiculous. Right? And so even if you had that data, like it puts me at increased risk for so many things. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. And to not talk to me about that and just like write it off as, well, Black women... Yeah. Yeah. It's it's ridiculous. I was reading a report uh, a couple, uh, about a year and a half ago, but something about how the doctor said because of the black woman's hair being more coarse, um, she was less acceptable to pain. No. You know, like, this, <laughs> no. yes, these are things. This is like very similar to how they used to say that um, black people's bone structure right was an indication right. of our uh, inferiority, inferior, yeah, lack you know, of intelligence, yes. whatever they wanted to. And, yeah, you know, and I, the more I think about how we're in a moment where we have a rapidly growing and unapologetic right, white supremacist right, it's not, it's not unbelievable to me that white folks are still perpetuating in and believing those narratives about Black people. And um, with Black women becoming more and more educated, one of the most educated demographics. You know, it's like for the type of um, pushback that we get by simply just existing, right? It's it's not surprising to me at all. And yet none of that will save us. Our education will not will save not us. My all. education, my access, my affluence, that didn't save me. Mm-hmm. That didn't mm-hmm. save me from hemorrhaging. That didn't right. save me from, like it didn't save me from so many things. And 
and we we don't know mm-hmm. exactly what puts it puts us at increased risk, but we've controlled for all these factors. Oh, we know. So we know. We know what we it know is. it's it, racism. You know, like <laughs> even with Shalon Irving, she was she worked for the CDC. Yes. You know, yes. like high in the Tell, ranks. Give a summary of the story. Okay, so Shalon Irving, she was a black woman. Um, I believe she was in her 30s, late 30s. I, don't remember I could her be age. mistaken. It's in the ProPublica article. Yeah. It, and so she um, was high in the ranks, um, public health professional, epidemiologist. She worked for the CDC. She had um, she had her baby successfully, but it was after the baby was delivered where she she started feeling unwell. Went to the doctor. They sent her home. She talked to her friend who encouraged her to go to the doctor. Um, and then shortly after visiting the doctor, she dropped dead from pre e. She had pre postpartum preeclampsia. And that's also another thing that Black women die a lot from after giving birth, you know? And so um, someone who's that educated, you know, and who even worked for the same agency that does this research and that puts out this data about about Black women dying, you know, was herself a victim to this same, you know, this disparity. Yeah. 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 Uh, so when did you first see it so clearly like when did you first see and understand how lost at the margins black women stories and experiences Mm -hmm. were and oh that question i'm like where do i start you know yeah where do i start um i have so many stories so many just from my own personal life and growing up and things that i saw to what i've seen in the workforce, being an adult, you know, what I've seen in the academy, being a student, you know, um, it, I could pick from various parts of my life. What age? Um, like, how old were you? I can remember as far back as being like seven. Yeah. And yeah. seeing the seeing the disparity, but maybe not having the language for it. Yeah. yeah. Definitely didn't have the language yeah, for it. Yeah. But I saw it and I had all the questions. No one asks, you know, but and definitely not the language. You know, I, I grew up seeing what it with that type of fear of I grew up in a home where there was some domestic violence and the f- type of fear that that c- was cultivated in a place where it's like you endure because you don't call the police mm. and you don't call the police because you call the police. Everybody's getting in trouble. Um, the kids are probably going to get taken. and. Um, the abuser is going to go to jail and the bills aren't going to be paid, you know? So you, you begin to wonder about how, um, these cycles, you know, that we go through, um, they definitely disproportionately impact black women. Um, and even like when I think about my grandmother, my grandmother, she was born in 1925. She had a very long life, but around mid 60s or so she lost her eyesight and we thought that it was because of old age um but come to find out she lived with syphilis for 40 years of her life and it affected her nervous system and no one ever knew no one ever talked about how my grandfather used to cheat on her no one ever mentioned a thing and she wasn't until you know she was like in her late 70s where a doctor revealed to our family that that's exactly what it was. And um, no one told her because we couldn't, we couldn't tell her that her husband cheated on her, you know? And so she was a very faithful woman, um, very God fearing woman. And this is what happens to black women. And we die not knowing a lot of times how we're impacted by systems of, of, um, Various kinds. Oh, yeah. And it, it it leaves you wanting to rage and scream like we matter. Yeah. And we absolutely can rage and scream. That's absolutely. like one of the most powerful tools that black women have. And I mean, that is, you know, I, I was I was looking over um, when he had asked, what is black girl magic to me? Yes. Right. Yeah. So I was going to go there. A huge part of black girl magic to me is being able to wield anger and rage with focus and precision. Like, and still despite, I mean, still persist despite, right? These things that we're faced with 
every single day. It's not necessarily enduring and not talking to anyone about it or being a strong black woman. It's being able to persist and 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 de- be determined to have joy in your life while also wielding that anger, you know, and using that anger as a tool, right? And so um I can absolutely understand why the black girl magic thing is now can be taken as another form of strong black woman. But what's magic about black women is that we can be angry as hell. We can be going through the most. We can be in great need and not afraid to ask for that help while at the same time we're thriving. You know, we are um we are taking care of our families. We are loving on our children and each other. And we are still here and and still doing what we need to do while understanding that we're not mules. You know, we don't continue to go and go and go. We take our time when we need it. And we are, again, using the type of anger that comes with being a Black woman in this society. And whether you're a cis Black woman or a trans Black woman and using that anger to power you through, right? So I, I hear you. I hear you. And that that is magic, mm-hmm. right? To persist amidst all that we endure is magic. And I wish more Black women would, would articulate the, the joy. Mm-hmm. Because I think I, the, the concern that I have is that the strong Black woman kind of, we can take it all, we can endure. Um, it, that it just that black girl magic just becomes synonymous with that. Like I'm magic, mm-hmm. and if I don't endure or if I can't carry the whole load, then I'm not magic and I'm less than. But your articulation of no, it's it's being able to focus the rage and anger that is righteous, that is that is totally justified, and also mm-hmm. yeah, have we, joy. We can hold a number of different we can things. we can hold them. Yeah, except I don't think our society has given us permission to. And, that's and we thing. have to take exactly. We have to stop, yeah, seeking permission Ex- for what's what's ours, Absolutely. you know. And we don't need permission to know that we can hold multiple things. Yep. Um. And yeah, it's it's not synonymous with being a strong black woman, you know. And it's not synonymous with even being the the angry black woman. It's synonymous with just being and and being a black woman means that you are going to be angry and hopefully you're going to experience joy too. Mm -hmm. And yet sometimes that joy is hard to tap into. How do you, how do you cultivate joy in the midst of all the work you're doing? You are in close proximity with a lot of pain. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How do you cultivate joy? Uh, I have to make it for myself. You know, that means, you know, a few times a day, I throw my ass in a circle to some trap music. A few times a day. And um, eating healthy food and going to the gym. Taking care of my body brings me a lot of joy. Surrounding myself with people who I love, you know. Um, I, for a long time, didn't surround myself with a lot of friends. And it was because I was one of those Black girls who grew up... Um, not knowing the value of black woman women friendship, like mm. not knowing uh, that trusting black women was going to be such a vital part of my survival. You know, like I grew up in a in a in a like a world where you we didn't trust women. They would they want to take our man or you know just some bullshit that patriarchy tells us, and so. Um, I didn't necessarily perpetuate those narratives, but what I did do is I've been skeptical a lot of my life. So I didn't learn how to value, invest in, um, in valuable friendships with Black women until I was well into my 20s. Really? Yeah. Really. What made you shift? What made you realize? Because I realized that Black women always had my back. Ah. Always, you know? I never had a reason to allow those negative narratives about Black women um, take that joy away from me to the point to where I never questioned it. You know, it was like, 
this isn't this isn't the, my reality. Mm-hmm. This isn't my reality. Mm-hmm. And even if it was my reality, what conditions are informing that type of behavior? Yeah. You know, like what type of conditions are informing people to 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 operate out of a scarcity mentality or to hurt other people? You know, and so I never really had to. Um, I never really allowed that to inform the way that I moved mm-hmm. um, to the point to where I had lived the rest of my life not knowing the value of Black woman friendships. So I surround myself with dope Black women, you know, and we don't have to talk every day. But when we do, it's like we picked up exactly where we left off. And um, I find so much joy in my daughter, you know, like I was a very young mom and we grew up together, you know. And seeing her grow and her analysis, she has a very sharp analysis of the world around her. And seeing that fire in her and doing all that I can to make sure that that fire isn't put out easily, right? Which means the things that I didn't grow up hearing, uh, wanting her to hear and, and wanting to make clear on the things that I did grow up hearing that weren't necessarily healthy or, or true um, to 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 black girls um, or to black people. And just seeing how much of a sponge she is and being able to notice like she's her own, she's her own person, you know? And she's what a lot of people would probably call sassy or spunk, you know, spunky, but it's like, yeah, she is those things and she should be those things. And who am I or anyone else to try to put that out, you know? Because then, what do we have when we begin to try to mold our children and put them in the boxes that we think they should be in? Like, that's not ladylike or, you know, you're too loud or you're laughing too loud, you know, just stuff like that. And so seeing her be full of joy and full of spunk and opinionated as ever, I, you know, sometimes, you know, I got to check her, you know, like, uh-uh, we ain't going to say that. But <laughs> so I really, I find much joy in seeing how she's blossoming. Mm-hmm. Um and yeah, traveling. I love to travel. Um, I mean, you said something that made me reflect on even just my own life that I think it is a tool of patriarchy to try to make women suspicious of each other. Mm-hmm. Because what if, what if we weren't and, and realized how powerful we were in, in community? Because I went to an all women's college. I went to an all women's college. It was probably white. And then I spent a year at Spelman, which is historically black college. So Mount Holyoke and Spelman, both all women. And without fail, when I tell people that I went to all women's college, they say things like, oh, women are so catty or, you know, they talk about women not being able to get along Mm -hmm. or whatever story or narrative they have. And that was not my experience. Like, of course, there were people who were like that. But Again, that's a it's a stereotype of women relationships. Mm-hmm, absolutely. And so I I I was able to see it, um, but I had it was probably it was probably college, or maybe even graduate school where I realized that it that it was a an intentional tool of sexism and racism, mm-hmm. right? Of those systems of oppression to try to keep us from connecting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. Yeah. And it makes you wonder, like, you don't hear people sitting around saying, oh, man, he always so aggressive. Right. Or, you know. Right. Oh, white men just can't get along. <laughs> right. Or why, are they, why, did, why is their mediocrity so upheld? Right. right. <laughs> like, you never hear that. And so it really makes you wonder, like, it, you know what it is. Yeah. We, we know. We know. Yeah. We know. You talked a little bit about your daughter, mm-hmm. and I feel like being a parent has been the hardest work that I've ever done and that my parent, my kids have been my greatest teachers, right? And, and I know your daughter and she does have a sharp analysis. How do you, how do you raise that? Mm -hmm. What does that look like for you to, uh, whether it's a conversations or how you expose her, how do you raise a child with such a sharp analysis? Mm -hmm. Um, It's no easy task, raising children, period. But Mm. You know, she's seen a lot. She's a movement baby, you know, and so uh, it's lots of conversation, lots of getting things right, getting things straight, because she hears a lot and it challenges what what I've taught her and it challenges what she has seen. But it's it's something that she considers because of either um, how reinforced negative 
um, narratives and stereotypes can be upheld out in the world um, and the cool factor of it all, you know? And so um, lots of conversations and, and teaching and um, sharing even of my own stories. She really likes to hear about things that happened when I was younger. And she really thinks that it was like a long time ago. Like she'll say something like, <laughs> we were at the store, I think it was like Target or something. And we were talking about a show. That's a Raven. Mm, okay. Mm -hmm. And I was yeah. like, oh, when I was little, I loved That's a Raven. And she was like, what? That's a Raven was out when you were, that was so long ago, like long, long ago. <laughs> yes. <laughs> My boys will say, that was like back in the 1900s. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, oh, Oh that does not make me feel any better about being 30. <laughs> but yeah, for her, that's what she thinks. It's like children's concept of time yes, is hilarious. It so is. it's humor in it. But she loves to hear about my experiences growing up, especially things that she can relate to now, like the mean girl stuff. Mm. Right. So I had heard that she had said something really cruel about another girl. And we had to have a intervention immediately because I was like, this is not what we're doing. You are not going to grow up believing that it's okay to tear other girls down, period. And she's a preteen now. So she's dealing with like all those hormonal changes and, and boys and like sexuality, like all of these things. Right. And so, um, there's like a boy who puts her and another girl against each other. And they say like, the other girl's a a hundred percent and Ken is a 40%. She's not that cute. You need to get braces. You need to get your teeth fixed. So her response to that is to tear the other girl down instead of tearing his ass down. You right? know? And I'm like, I'm like, so let's, let's, let's take, look at the big picture here. You know, let's look at how these things are working, you know, and having conversations around not tearing other women down, especially when, when, when you have, a, a boy who's putting you against someone for something as simple as their opinion on how you compare to another woman that will happen for the rest of your life. And if you let that defeat you now, you are going to have a very, very hard time as you grow up in this world, you know, and I try to reinforce black sisterhood mm -hmm. and black relationships with other women um, and girls and you know, it's sticking, I see. But the challenges of puberty are definitely against us both. Yes. So. Yes. Oh, gosh. Yeah. It's hard. It's very hard. It's hard. Ooh. Well, we could talk about so many things, but I want to make sure we make time for this newest project, this mm -hmm. newest idea that you're that you're implementing around sharing the stories of Black women mm -hmm. in pregnancy. Yeah. I haven't talked a lot about it um, publicly. So this is the first time where Are I'm going to talk, okay talk about it. You okay talking about it? I'm okay talking okay. about it. Um, so it has a working title right now, You Lucky You Got a Mama. And it highlights uh, Black pregnant people and Black pregnant women's experiences and what it means to be pregnant at a time where you are three to four times likely to die as a result of childbirth. And it is canonizing Black women and highlighting us in our natural form, in our homes, doing our children's hair, um, going to the doctor, you know, and really humanizing us um, as people who have not only forged the, you know, what, OB practices today, but also, you know, um, showing us in our day to day as we continue to use reproductive labor and our physical labor to um, contribute to and make America what it is. Right. And so yeah. um, also capturing interviews um, and stories of black women and what their birth and labor experiences like uh, following women during some of their postpartum period to to get that healing process and what how does it feel to have survived this mm -hmm. you know and really wanting to use the data and the research that we that we have available to us and and 
com- put it with visuals, right? To bring it to people who, if this is not your area of interest, your area of expertise, or even if you just simply don't know that it exists, right? Bringing it to people and saying, okay, if if we if you don't read the research for whatever reason, here's a, another way to consume or to to um, get what the current condition is for Black women and Black pregnant people in America. Like, here's a way for it. Maybe it's more easily digestible this way, but really wanting to provide people with these experiences so that they know, like, nationally, it's not just Black women who are dying at an exponential rate nationally, but it's also right here in St. Louis. And these are real faces and bodies of people who are impacted. And you don't really have to dig for it. Like, it's right here. And so... um. It's going to take me all of 2019 to work on this project because I'm going to be between here and Oakland this summer and then um, other travels for work. And so it's going to take a while, but I'm taking my time with it. I hope to have everything completed and uh, and ready for public view by December. That's yeah. beautiful. And it's so it's it's necessary. It's necessary to give people another way to to process the data, mm-hmm. right? Not everyone's a numbers person. The, th- the whole three, two times more likely, is it, it's not going to resonate with folks as some people, as much as stories will, mm-hmm. pictures, visuals, and to think about this woman that I'm seeing is at risk. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think we'll touch people in a way that's important. And that's why so many funding agencies are, are uh, marry, marrying art and data. Mm-hmm. So yeah. this is ripe to be funded. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I don't I'm have excited any funders for you. yet. So. so if anyone's interested in funding <laughs> such a project, be in touch. Yes, yeah. please. Yeah. Yeah. If you could, well, it's your daughter. I was going to say, if you could share with a younger version of yourself yeah. or a Black woman, kind of how if, the recipe for staying in, in touch with, grounded in, and cultivating your mm-hmm. own sense of worth and dignity amidst all that we know will challenge it. Mm-hmm. What would you say is that recipe? Mm, so many things. Mm-hmm. I didn't learn until summer of 2018 that I didn't have to have it all figured out. You know, I lived, <laughs> I lived so much of my life thinking that I have to have it all figured out, like all the things, you know, and if, a vision or a dream, something that I thought I saw for myself wasn't fulfilled in the way that I thought it would be, you know, that that meant that I was a failure or it spoke to my self-worth or it spoke to um, whether or not I was valuable enough to like have those things. Maybe it just wasn't for people like me, you know? And so knowing that your story is your own and the thing about life is it, it, constantly is going to evolve as you evolve and things are going to happen unexpectedly. You know, um, all you really have is what I would prioritize and what I've learned to prioritize is what is important to me, why people who I love around me and um, knowing that I have support in place to, to guide me as I'm on this life journey. And so not having it all figured out um, and not, not knowing that you don't have to do anything alone um, and knowing that sometimes you just got to say, like, you got to scratch, you got to scratch it. If it didn't work out, done, move on to the next thing, you know, and don't get so consumed in, like, wanting to make something that just isn't going to work for your life work because that's what life is. You know, you grow from it, you learn, you move on, and you you go after the next endeavor. I wonder if some of that is about, is, a, is like in response to white supremacy. So perfectionism mm-hmm. is a very white. Oh my gosh. Yes. Right. Like to be perfect. Right. And so as black women who get told we're not enough, mm-hmm. we don't meet those standards, a way that we might take in those messages and then try to compensate mm-hmm. is to be perfect, is to oh, do absolutely. so much, is to be achieve. And we've talked about we this before. Right. We both struggle with absolutely. it. Absolutely. You know? Yeah. yeah. And so just to like make plain for folks as they listen, like, I think it's, yeah, sometimes a response mm-hmm. that overachievement 
and then you get in this habit because it gets it gets rewarded. Yes, it gets rewarded and it gets rewarded and you are beat down, tired with nothing to give. Right. Anyone. Right. <laughs> you know, like perfectionism spills over into your career life, your personal life, your parenting, you know, like. It is not. It's toxic. Those aren't our standards. It's toxic. No, those are not standards that we set. Like right. those are standards that have been set by white supremacy that we have been trying to meet because it has, we've been rewarded to feel like if we're able to meet those standards, then we're worthy. Then we're okay. Yeah. We're good enough. Yeah. And that's not the mark of our worth. Not at all. Yeah. Not at all. I feel like there's a collective reckoning happening around that. At least I, I, believe I so. hope so. And, you know, I'm so happy that more and more people are beginning to talk about imposter syndrome. Too. Oh, yes. You know, like that's something I never had a name for it mm-hmm. until maybe the past two to three years. Mm-hmm. Like being able to actually name that there, there are things that make you feel like despite like no matter what you've earned, no matter how hard you've worked, no matter how much you've strived for perfectionism. There's still something that tells, and this impacts mostly black women, that you're not good enough to be where you're at. Mm -hmm. Or there's someone better than you who can do this better than you. Or You're going to get found out. Yeah. Yeah. You're going to get found out about it. And people are going to know that you're faking it the whole time. Right. You know? And I think there are people who feel like, oh, I felt that too. And it's it's a phenomenon, that self-doubt that anyone can experience, regardless of your racial background. But given the fact that Black women, again, are at the margins and have all these messages Mm -hmm. that they don't fit, that they're not enough, that their society will not advocate for you. They'll advocate for white women when Mm -hmm. it comes to women, and they'll advocate for Black men when it comes to race, Mm -hmm. but that you're on your own. Mm -hmm. People need to understand that that compounds and impacts the experience of imposter syndrome. Oh, absolutely. So it's not just a, I am doubting myself. It's I am seeped in in these structures and in these systems that inherently doubt me yeah. and tell me I don't matter. And then I'm also supposed to muster up the, you know, the internal stuff to be able to like counter that. And yet we do, which is the magic. Yeah. That's the magic. And, and, and yeah, it, that, I don't even know what more to say. Well, I appreciate you talking to me. I feel like we could go on forever and we could have so much to talk about. I know, five more (laughs) conversations. So we will. Will you come back? Of course. Okay. Yeah. So if people want to fund your amazing project Mm -hmm. or just want to follow what you're doing, how can they find you and follow you? Okay. So if you want to fund my major project, email me, uh, Farrell, F E R R E L L L, three L's, Brittany at gmail.com, and let's talk about it. If you want to follow me, um, can't guarantee what you'll get. A little ratchet, a little professional. But uh, Badula Avlangata is my Twitter handle. And that's B-D-O-U-L-A-O-B-G-A-T-A. Badula Avlangata. We'll put it up there. Yeah, put it up there. Yeah. People. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for joining of us. Of course. Thank you for having me. Yeah. And thank you for joining us on Raising Equity. Hopefully you enjoyed hearing all about the amazing things Brittany's doing and more broadly understand some of the dynamics that play into black women um, experiencing the world in a way that puts us at the margins, but more importantly, how we persist and how we thrive and are resilient and experience joy amidst the systemic oppression.